morning. Uh, today we are, we are looking at uh, an overview of social policy and uh, we uh, have there are three things we want to, to, uh, to look at. No, we can't have this overview up here. Yeah, the social policy landscape. Then we are going to look at the uh, key developments that have taken place over the last few years. We want to look at the impact of the crisis of 2008 on social policy. Then we go on to look at rights, particularly the right to work, income and participation. Uh, we go on then to, to look at basic income and propose that it is a better pathway forward. And finally, we look at some objections, populist objections to basic income. So then to, 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 to begin with uh, our paper, uh, we, we talk about different approaches to uh, social policy. Uh, social policy has changed fundamentally in both Europe and in North America in recent decades. Governments have taken different approaches to addressing issues such as social welfare, labor market policies, and the provision of services in areas such as education and health. Trends in social welfare are no longer simply a question of whether the resources allocated are rising or falling. Mm -hmm. Ensuring that everyone has the basics required to live life with dignity is a much more challenging task today than it was even 20 years ago. We have seen the emergence of issues such as activation, social investment, social inclusion, and the growing focus on the connection between rights and responsibilities. In summary, there have been two opposing viewpoints uh, to uh, concerning what has been happening. On the one hand, many argue that there is a neoliberal logic underpinning developments in recent decades and that this approach implies the dismantling of the traditional welfare state. On the other hand, many believe that what we are seeing is the development of reforms that help to modernize welfare and ensure that it adjusts to the realities of the 21st century. So we go on then to look at three key developments. And the first one, concerns citizenship. Marshall understood the welfare state to have emerged from a broadening understanding of citizenship and the rights that went with being a citizen. He noted the evolution of rights. In the 18th century, civil rights had emerged. These included freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right to own property. These were followed in the 19th century by the emergence of political rights for citizens. These included the right to vote, to hold public, and to hold public office. Marshall saw the 20th century as having produced social rights. These included the right to economic and social security through education, housing, healthcare, pensions, and other services. This third stage in the development of rights led to the acceptance of the view that everyone was entitled to sufficient income to live a full, active life irrespective of their background. While there is some debate about Marshall's analysis, his core point that rights and responsibilities are closely linked with the idea of citizenship has been very popular in recent years as the idea of active citizenship has been promoted. His understanding of an evolving and expanding set of rights linked to citizenship continues to exercise major influence. Some would argue that the evolution of rights continues as they point to the emergence of rights and responsibilities towards the environment as a further development in that process. Two factors that are essential to the development of this kind of citizenship envisaged by Marshall are Firstly, the needs to be a recognition of the in interdependence of the political, the social, and the civil dimension of policy. And secondly, there is a need for a, second for a social dialogue that can ensure the experiences and the concerns of vulnerable and or excluded groups are recognized in the development of the common good. The second key development in recent decades concerns benefits, entitlements, and the welfare state. Different governments are using different approaches. Some have emphasized social investment. Others have highlighted the enabling state. Others, again, are focusing on the active welfare state. Some of these developments are reducing benefits, while others are not. What is clear is that these adjustments are bringing qualitative changes to the welfare state. The third development, uh, which flows from the two already mentioned, highlights is that we are, the two already highlighted, is that we are witnessing a change in paradigm underlying the welfare state. While there is a recognition that ongoing funding of the welfare state is challenging, the principal focus has not been on achieving purely quantitative targets. Rather, a qualitative focus has sought to discover new ways of ensuring that welfare 
could be delivered in a more efficient way that suited the changing economic and political realities. Those who are arguing for, the, for an activating social investment agenda are in fact seeking a profound paradigm shift. We see welfare as not only, they see welfare as not only about protecting people, but also about enhancing their capacity to deal with their changing environments. A new reality seems to have emerged since 2008, one in which social policy has been downgraded and pushed to the sidelines when major decisions are being made. The economic and fiscal crisis of 2008 led to the sharpest contraction of, of European economies since the Great Depression. In 2009, for example, the economic output of the countries of the European Union shrank by 4.5%, and more than 6 million people have lost their jobs. Commenting on this situation, the distinguished economist and philosopher Martha Sen pointed out, what began as, as a clear failure of the market economy, particularly associated with financial institution, institutions, was soon interpreted as a problem of the overstretched role of the state, leading to the prioritization of austerity measures. As the crisis spread, a series of measures were adopted, including consolidation and adjustment, which led to austerity, uh, austerity policies. Fiscal supervision, which led to new fiscal governance mechanism, for example, the fiscal compact. These are political responses to an economic crisis and, and are inappropriate. This has led to a situation where the uh, perception of a democratic deficit at the heart of the EU has been reinforced and citizens in many countries experience a sense of powerlessness. So what has been the impact of the, of the, of the um, crisis? A number of studies in the, of the period from 2008 to 2013 across the uh, number of EU states show greatly reduced incomes, increased poverty and social exclusion, increased unemployment, increased numbers of people living in low intensity, in low work intensity households. The Europe 2020 strategy was supposed to focus on achieving high levels of employment, productivity and social cohesion. Now research shows that social cohesion is declining or at least under new pressures. This is due not only to the uh, economic and employment crisis, but also due to the longer term trends such as growing inequality, migration, immigration, and the increased cultural diversity and increasing social disparities in relation to issues of poverty, labor market access, health, and equitable education. Studies also show that social justice has been under pressure, it has, has had a negative effect on social justice in most countries. The impact of the crisis on social policy shows that the EU 2020 strategy was given nowhere near the priority or the resources it required if it were to be a substantial counterweight to the austerity policies being implemented. Over the past 50 years then, a future of full employment and zero poverty has been held out as a viable outcome of the policies being followed. It is time for the EU to recognize that these policies are not fit for the purpose of delivering such a future. The, the present model is broken and it is time to face that reality. Alternatives need to be analyzed and tested. We believe that basic income is one such alternative. So what should guide society's understanding and development of the future? In this paper, we now go on to argue that shaping a viable, sustainable future must start with the understanding of the common good. And Sean will take up now. <coughs> Thank you. Now, in the, in the paper, we have a certain amount of material drawing on sources from John Rawls, the National Economic and Social Council, looking at the whole issue of what the common good needs and so on. Uh, I don't know that I want to spend much time on it here in this because we are up against it having started a little bit late, we're trying to catch up in time. But it's there and we can tease it out in the discussion if people want to focus on that particular issue. But it is central because the new paradigm does need some kind of basis and we would argue that uh, the, the common good is a very, very good way of actually, say, uh, put a, a, a would provide a very good foundation for uh, a new paradigm. Um, it, basically being the sum of the conditions, for example, of social life by which individuals, families and groups uh, can achieve their own fulfillment in a relatively thorough and ready way. One of the things that's core, core to this is the, re the need to, to recognize that 
uh, both the human rights and the common good are interdependent in the sense that we won't have the human rights that Bridget has been talking about and their development without some focus and uh, without some recognition uh, that uh, these are important to be delivered as part of the common good. Likewise, I don't think we will deliver the common good without uh, a recognition of the rights that are there. So uh, the other piece that's important in all of that is sustainability, uh, because at the end of the day, if uh, whatever we're trying to develop in, in a new paradigm is not sustainable, uh, then there's no point in having it. For example, it's, uh, there's a lot of talk today about uh, environmental sustainability, but there's a lot of challenges in economic sustainability, and even more in, I think, more challenging and less ign uh, and more ignored, if you like, social sustainability. Because what we are developing a lot of the time, we fail to ask the question: Will people want to live in this kind of society? And if they don't, then we're not going to go too far. That that particular approach, whatever it might be, would not actually go very far. So I think we're in this kind of um, situation. Okay. Now, we in Social Justice Ireland have been arguing for quite a while that seven basic rights need to be, re uh, need to be secured for everybody if um, they're to have what, what is required to live life with dignity. By the way, these are not the only rights that we think are important or essential, but we do think they're essential in this context and we highlight them. Uh, people, uh, everybody needs the right uh, to meaningful work, to, to, access to, me to have access to meaningful work to have access to enough income to live life with dignity, to have access to real participation, that's just the notion of participation, uh, to have access to relevant education, uh, essential health care, appropriate accommodation, and cultural respect. And um, they're not the only rights, as I say, but they are essential if we're to have, li if we can to live our lives with dignity. Um, now, they're not, these rights are not currently available to large numbers of people in the European Union in the way not that they don't have theoretically the right to access these, but in actual fact, having them and exercising them uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the challenge. And uh, there are huge numbers of people in poverty, the unemployed. Uh, we have seen, for example, not that uh, in our own uh, time, quite an amount of emergence of people being quite annoyed about the fact that they are not consulted, they, are, they have no real participation in shaping the decisions that affect them. New approaches are, quite, are needed in that context. Um, most people in Ireland would feel that they got very little, if any, say, for example, in the decisions that led to the bailout and all the various austerity approaches that have been used since then. But that's also true, I think, a lot of people would have been reacting to the lack of uh, voice that they have in places, in, in votes, recent votes like Brexit and the election in the United States as well. Now, for the rest, I want to go on to focus on the first three of these here. Um, not because the others aren't important, but I think these are kind of interrelated and they are uh, central. The first of these is the right to work. There's um, the, the meaning of work is, a, is an issue uh, uh, that we need to look at. When you ask people what they work at, they hear the question as being, what job do you have? And then what we've done in effect as a society and as a world really is to limit the meaning of work down to paid employment. Uh, which it obviously is not. Uh, there are there are lots of other there's lots of other work uh, that should be that is recognised as work really, except that it's not treated as work because it's not paid employment. Uh, sort of work and development of the of oneself, of one's family, of one's community, of the wider society, all sorts of things that co that uh, that contribute in one way or another in that way need to be recognised, even if they are not paid employment. Um, there's um, the, the, the role of, uh, of work in personal development needs to be recognized quite strongly. Uh, likewise, uh, the social dimension of work, because we relate to other people. We are social beings and we relate to other people through work. Um, work is essential as well, um, and participation in meaningful work is essential if people are to actually participate in developing the society and the world in which they live and in providing the goods and services. Uh, but the critical thing that's important in this context in a world which is seeing a rise, uh, high levels of unemployment, in a world that has for two and a half centuries promised full employment and never delivered it, uh, I think we need to be facing the fact that there are serious issues in which uh, that we're now coming to a point we need to recognize that we will not have full employment 
in our generation or the next generation or any future generation that we can envisage. And consequently, we need to recognize that in that context, uh, that everybody has a right to work. So what, what that actually, it, there's a quite serious challenge there that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, we also need uh, to look at the, the right to income. Uh, um, large numbers of people are living in poverty, even in the European Union, and uh, the ri one of the richest areas of the world in our own country. Um, we, have, we have scandalous situations, and I think people are aware of the numbers. I'm not going to go through them here. They're in the, they're in the paper. But the, what we would say is adequate income is a birthright. Um, but that there is, like, Ireland is not a poor country. Ireland ha has more than enough resource to ensure that everybody has enough income to live life with dignity. But there, it's a distribution issue, a political issue in many ways, and we haven't actually addressed it, and we don't seem to be heading towards addressing it either, which is a quite serious issue. Since the Industrial Revolution, uh, the paradigm is based on income being distributed through payment for jobs done. But then if people don't have access to jobs for great parts of their lives, or if the new world of jobs, which are precarious and um, short term and uh, all uh, low pay and so on, these kinds of uh, challenges that are there, um, there and uh, uh, people forget in a way, they think that uh, income is what you, you get your income by doing a job and you get paid for the value of the job that you do uh, and that that's, you know, it's the effort that you put in gets you the money, but that's actually not true. Uh, it's very, the, the level of income that you actually get is very tied to the technology you have access to or to the power of your negotiating group. So, okay, it has certain amounts of contribute, uh, or it's in some parts con connected to uh, the work you actually do, but there are huge other issues there. So uh, what we're basically saying, jobs were not delivered in the last couple of centuries for everybody. They won't be delivered in the future. So a new uh, paradigm is requi required uh, to deal with, um, to reclaim people's birthright. And that brings us to the third, because participation and work are essential as well. Um, people can t people have, a, have a right to be involved. Uh, they have a right to, to um, to, to shape the world in which they live. They have a right to participate in shaping the decisions that impact on them. But that's not the experience that great many people have. So participation and, um, is, is critical and is very, very important. And um, it particip people participate through work, but there's also lots of other things, as I pointed out. There's one little piece there that, uh, that I would draw your attention to on pages 19 and 20. Uh, I just referenced them up there. Seven principles to guide a just process of decision making. Because sometimes in this country, we don't seem to think that people have a right to participate in shaping decisions because we can't think of ways in which they can, we can resolve disagreement. Um, if you look at the seven, all people affected by decisions are to have an equal right to take part in and to determine the outcome of and the processes that establish the decisions that, with which they are to comply. And there are a series of other pay, uh, uh, um, principles in there, I think they're very good. People have a right to disagree with and to oppose any proposal being made for decision. Uh, sometimes, for example, in, in some of the response to, to Brexit, you wonder, uh, do we have a choice in uh, making, in sort of what, what should be done? Uh, we're dictated to about this, that, and the other is what has to be done. And when you raise an issue saying, for example, uh, could we go back and check how, why Brexit happened in the first place, what are the causes? That's seen as, uh, from the very top, to seen as sort of a heretical question that's not allowed. I've had that experience myself uh, with, with the same uh, leader, or good leader, so in that, in that sense I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to something that, that, that's real, and I, I, that would concern me hugely. Uh, we're, we're running around dealing with the consequences of a quite serious event. All of those consequences have to be dealt with. But unless we're dealing with the causes, we'll be back making similar decisions again and having similar discussions in due course. So moving on to basic income specifically, there's a definition of basic income. You'll get several versions of this in, your, in, the, in the various papers of the book today and in the introduction and so on. Our, the way we do it is, uh, is we, take, we take this off the Basic Income Ireland website, so I think we, we both agree that this is what it should be. A universal u a basic income is a payment from the state to every resident on an individual basis without any means test or work requirement. It would be sufficient to live a frugal but decent lifestyle without supplementary income from paid employment. 
for further information that I, was, I refer you in the book to, to Basic Income Ireland's website and our own website and Basic uh, and Bien's web website as well. Uh, I think the, the objectives of Basic Income are to address growing fragility in the labour market, the precariat, not enough jobs and so on. Secondly, the failure to eliminate poverty even in very rich nations needs to be addressed. Uh, the, 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 the need to address exclusion of vulnerable, of vulnerable people from having a voice. And um, basic income, we would argue, will actually deal with all of these. There's a series of populist arguments um, that, and, uh, as long as you're armed, actually, um, some of them are, uh, came out in this morning, in Morning Ireland this morning. Uh, in, uh, she was, uh, was, uh, was dealing with one or two of them. Um, but uh, there, you, you get these automatically, these kind of populist arguments against it. Um, we, I think, list about 10 there, and we deal with them uh, very quickly. Um, basic income would encourage idleness. This simply isn't true. Uh, in, in effect, when it's the other way around, people are encouraged to be idle because they must be available for jobs that don't exist. And they, if they do something useful, they'll probably be cost and kind of uh, the claim will be made that they're not available for the non-existent job, so therefore they may well lose their entitlements or whatever. The bottom line is that Basic income actually encourages people's engagement, not the idleness. It promotes the end of work. No, it does not. Anybody who supports basic income is very strongly of, in, our, in favor of, the, of work and having meaningful work and decent work. And not alone that, but the studies that have been done show that people, once they're freed up from having these kind of conditions that are in welfare, actually are, with a floor under them, are much more likely to become involved. Feasibility, uh, they say is, uh, that it's not affordable. Uh, I think Malcolm Torrey, he's, he's, he's presenting, I think, the next paper actually here. Um, uh, he has just produced a book on, fees, on the feasibility of basic income under every heading you could possibly think about. He'll tell you about all of it, or some of it anyway, uh, in his paper. But the bottom line on this is, of course, it's affordable. And it's affordable in Ireland as well, as we will show later in the, in the day in another paper being presented uh, by Eamon Murphy and Sean Ward. Um, there is. Um, uh, it would mean a large increase in tax. In fact, that's not true. It would involve um, a, a reasonable approach to ta and a very much fairer approach to taxation because it would eliminate some of the tax breaks that benefit better off people and that other people don't have access to. Uh, and the, you'll see the, the tax proposal that's in the paper that I mentioned already is there as well. Uh, there's a migration issue. Um, uh, Again, um, the issue here is uh, misrepresented endlessly. I was, I was quite annoyed myself to see somebody like Henning Meyer, who's the editor of Social Europe Journal, uh, peddling this nonsense. Um, because in actual fact, uh, when you introduce a basic income, you would obviously have conditions on people accessing it when they come into the country. It's not a question that we're going to be flooded by people from Eastern Europe, all of them coming for basic income, because they wouldn't have a right to a basic income. They don't have a right to welfare when they come in in the first place either. So they, it, it would have to be built up over, over time. And uh, I think that's the way this would work, and there are lots of ways of doing that. But I think it's important when you're objecting to something that, the thing, the, the, that there would be some basis to some of the claims that are made. Uh, another one of the... Sorry, um, Don. Sorry, my, my, my screen here is different to what you're seeing. I'm sorry. These are five more that would encourage idleness. Um, something wrong here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's the next one. Okay, so it would it lead to the abolition of the welfare state. This is nonsense. Uh, of course, it won't. Uh, it all like a, a basic income without the services and so on. Uh, that are required and, and all the rest of the, the welfare state uh, would be problematic in the first place. So basic income would, come, um, would not lead to the abolition of the welfare state. What it would do is it would provide the income com component, put that into place, uh, but you still have to have decent education and health and all the rest of the welfare state, um, and I think that's important. Basic income uh, doesn't solve the inequality issue. You know, there's most of our social policy wouldn't actually qualify very well or be funded if that was going to be the condition on which it was actually funded. Uh, I mean, does anybody suggest that our current system promotes the equality, equality all that well? Um, that doesn't mean that equality shouldn't be comp uh, promoted. Of course it should. We would argue that um, basic income may not solve the inequality, but it will actually 
promote equality a little bit, at least by putting a floor under everybody that is actually there and as of right and not taken away any time during their lives. Um, everyone should earn their living. I, think I find this kind of um, interesting in the context of the way it understands earning. Uh, apparently, people who are well off are born into wealthy families, don't have to work at all for their lives, and that's perfectly okay. They can live off the family's money and enjoy the life any way they like, and that's perfectly okay, but the rest of us have to earn our living for some reason or other. I would duly respectfully suggest that that's daft and uh, <laughs> coming to that kind of conclusion, and that what we really need is, is people need to contribute to uh, shaping their, 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 own, their, their, their own future, shaping the future of the society they're in, making contribution and having the capacity to do that, and that uh, in that process <coughs> uh, they contribute. Basic income reduces um, the value of work to mere income. With due respect, I think it's the other way around, uh, that uh, tying a, a work to a payment for a job uh, ties work to mere income. And it's not the other way around. In actual fact, by putting a floor under everybody, we liberate people. So it's not, uh, the, and then so it's not, it's not a me, the, turning it into some work into some mere income. Um, and basic income is an inefficient use of public resources. Um, I smile and I could give you lots of examples of uh, what might happen if we actually applied that principle to everywhere. And, and lots of public policy, uh, you know, getting value for money and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the, an efficient use of public resources. What I would say is I would argue very strongly that basic income is one of the most efficient uses of public resources. And we have real uh, po uh, potential in that, in, in that, in that situation. Um, no, okay. Final slide. Um, is it really utopia or a practical solution? I think the thing that we would point to first is that the current approach is failing to deliver and a universal basic income has the capacity to be the cornerstone of a new paradigm. And our conclusion would be that it is both a radical step towards a desirable future and a practical solution to several major challenges facing society today. That's why we would strongly support the development of a basic income system and its implementation in Ireland, in the European Union, and across the world. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Sean. And we'll take one or two quick questions if anybody has anything just to start off. Can't, can't, can't let them away with. Uh, thanks for the great paper. Um, Given the so would, you, would you identify yourself, please? Just oh yeah, Paul O'Brien. I'm with the um, Basic and Come Ireland. Um, given the exorbitant rentals um, people have to pay in Dublin, uh, how would somebody survive on basic income uh, without um, considerable additional um, payments, and, and, and would that make basic income? Um, feasible. Thanks for that. But we'll, we'll take one more just before yeah. we revert to um, Bridger or Sean here. Yeah, we're just on it. This lady here. Uh, Mary Ryan, it's a very simple question. Um, Sean, you mentioned uh, that we're a rich country and indeed I feel that myself, but when people ask me, so how exactly are we rich? Because the people who make the real money in the country don't pay adequate tax. How are we rich? Where, do, where does our money come from exactly, please? Okay. <laughs> we thought these were going to be easy short question. question, easy question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Paul's question first. Um, I, I think we need to be a little bit careful um, that we are not going to uh, basically challenge, uh, make it a condition that basic income has to do everything that the current system doesn't do. And the current system has serious problems on housing. Okay. And uh, we have serious issues as a society because of the failure to provide sufficient supply, particularly of social housing. And uh, the plans, although they're welcome, that are currently in place, are not on the scale required, even uh, if fully implemented, which government pl uh, plans rarely are. But even if fully implemented, they will, they will fall far short of what is required to meet the basic, uh, the basic 
requirements to, for a sufficient social housing by the year, the year, the end of the plan, 2021 or whatever it is. Um, now that, pro that problem still remains if you have a basic income or don't, and still has to be addressed whether you have a basic income or don't. Uh, what, we are, what we are doing today in this conference is for the first time putting up a paper or putting out a paper that says maybe the place to start with basic income is a universal housing payment. And that, payment, that paper has been done by Ronan Lyons, who most Irish people will know is an expert on housing. And he will present that uh, at the end. It will be one of the last papers in the morning session, although in the book it's, at the, it's in the Irish section of the part, so it's at the end. But he has to go back to Trinity. I mentioned that earlier. So he, he's not able to be here in the afternoon, so he'll present it in the morning. But we'll deal with it in the afternoon in, the, in there, as the, in, in that uh, round table later on in the, in the day as well. And how are we rich? We're basically rich in a variety of different ways. but. Uh, our income per capita is uh, one of the highest in the world. We're one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, our growth levels economically are very high. Um, what we, uh, our, like our, uh, another part of our wealth are the people and so on. Uh, we have serious issues about how that income and that wealth and that those riches are actually used because we don't have a good education system, certainly not of, of the caliber that most people would want or a good um, uh, health system or there's, there's huge challenges uh, in our st services and in our infrastructure. We're way below the European averages on these and most people I think would like to see that improved and that allocation should go in that direction. Uh, and I think the election, for example, show that people tended to want it to go in that direction. And I think the um, argument before the budget of 2017 budget, where that uh, we certainly made the argument and lots of others agreed with us that uh, all of the available fiscal space, as we call it nowadays, uh, should actually be available, made uh, used for services and infrastructure to improve them. But in actual fact, government used it differently and spent over a third on tax cuts, which uh, benefited the better off uh, more than they benefited uh, low-income people. So there's, a, there's an issue there. Uh, so but so Can you, well, let, let me ask you a question. Can you see money being produced without people? Yeah, I can't. Okay. Can you repeat the question? My friend asked me before, I'm trying to think of what that question is. I know, but, well, you see, I, I, I think there is a kind of a, and I, we can have a discussion about this. This is probably too tight in our, uh, a space to be trying to do it in. But I, I think it's kind of uh, nonsense for people, for the, the kind of argument that says uh, that, uh, you know, it's the people who produce products are the people uh, who create the, the, the wealth and the money, you know? Uh, I don't think that that's actually true. I think they contribute to it. I think everybody contributes in one form or another. It ver the, the, it's a variation on the thing like that the kind of, the, the amount of lack of knowledge about uh, basic economics in Ireland is, is staggering. Now it might be confi confined to Ireland, but give you, let me give you another example of the same kind of uh, top of the head con conclusion that is totally false. Uh, it, you get an awful lot of stuff, for example, that says, like, there should be no benefits to people uh, on social welfare. There should be no increases. Why? Because they don't pay any tax. That is a lie. It's untrue. Sorry. Maybe the people making it are so dim that they don't get it. But in actual fact, a third of their income goes on tax because they have to pay that on everything they practically that they buy. They have to pay it for levies and all the rest of the stuff like everybody else. So even though they mightn't pay a penny in income tax, they actually wind up paying a third of their total income on tax. So to suggest that there should be no increase in welfare because uh, these people pay no tax is simply untrue. You know, the, like the, 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 the premise on which it's based is false. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time, uh, uh, it is actually a lie that a lot of the people making this claim are well aware of the reality, but actually are arguing for other particular groupings. There's, there's one crowd in particular, there's one outfit, uh, I have described them, I'm not going to name them, but I've described them before as producing uh, propaganda masquerading as research uh, around the issue of taxation. And they get huge coverage, in fact they get more coverage than anybody else on the issue of taxation, and they are simply a lobby group for business and they're very well paid and they are very well resourced, but they're, they're dealt with on programs like RTE as if they were the gold standard in terms of objective analysis of, 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 um, uh, on tax. 
happen in actual fact. Oh. They're talking rubbish. And they know it, what's more. 